everybody. I want to thank you all for joining us today. My name is Quincy Hensel. I'm the CEO at the Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce, and we are very pleased to be able to host this webinar today to discuss changes and updates regarding unemployment insurance in Maine. A very special thank you to Commissioner Laura Fortman of the Department of Labor. To say it's been an incredibly busy time for the department is probably a gross understatement. So we're very grateful for your time today. And I know that there's a lot of employers and employees who are trying to navigate the unemployment system for the first time. And I also know there's been a good deal of changes made to make accessing unemployment easier. So we wanna discuss that today on this webinar. Also joining me today is my co-moderator, Julia Trujillo. Julia is the Director of the Office of Economic Opportunity at the City of Portland. She's been working really closely with us at the Chamber, helping us to navigate questions for employers who have an immigrant workforce. So Julia is joining us today and she's going to be covering some of those issues and topics as well. We have one hour scheduled for this webinar. So without further ado, I would like to turn this over to the commissioner to give us a brief overview of the state of unemployment in Maine. We will be saving plenty of time for questions. So I know some people have submitted questions ahead of time. You can also use the chat function to submit questions. Um, and we will try our best to get to all of them. And those that we do not get to, we will try to get answers to and get them out to all of the participants after the fact. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to Commissioner Fortman. Thank you, Quincy, and uh, thank you, Julia. And I'm joined here today by my colleague, Deputy Commissioner, Kim Smith. Good afternoon. And we will try to give a top line overview of uh, what's going on with unemployment and get to as many of your questions as we can. One thing I do wanna say as we kind of start out this afternoon is um, that, that what we're doing today is a conversation. This is not legal advice. And a, unemployment insurance is incredibly complicated and very fact specific. So there are many, many, many issues where the answer is actually, it depends. It depends on certain circumstances what the outcome will be. So today we will focus on kind of top line overview of the programs and um, speak in generalities about um, what may be applicable. So we hope the information is helpful. I don't know, Kim, if there was anything you wanted to add to that or? No, I think that's a, a great point. We get lots of questions about specific cases and um, while a lot of them are similar, there's always unique things about each one that make them um, unique that we have to take the individual <laughs> cases as they come. So to just kind of get back to the basics, unemployment insurance, is uh, paid for by employers. And since this is the chamber, I'm sure you're well aware of that. Uh, the employers pay a certain amount into the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund on the first $12,000 of earnings for all of their employees. And then when someone loses a job through no fault of their own, um, there's a monetary eligibility determination that's done. Uh, the, the claimant would um, have to have earned at least $5,100 in the previous five calendar quarters. Um, and in two of those five previous calendar quarters, they would have needed to earn over $1,700. That's how monetary eligibility is determined. If you meet that threshold, the next question is, um, <clears throat> have you lost your job through no fault of your own? If the answer is yes, then are you able to work, available to work, and actively seeking work? And what has changed during the pandemic is that the Maine legislature on about March 17th passed legislation that was signed by the governor on, I believe, March 18th that gave the department some flexibility around those able of, and available provisions as well as the um, actively seeking work. The intent was that if someone stayed connected to their employer, um, that they would not need to be doing that work search portion. And the other change that was made was that 
typically there's a one week waiting period before someone becomes eligible for unemployment insurance. The legislature um, eliminated that one week waiting period. And then the third change was that employers pay into the trust fund um, based in part on their experience rating. If they lay off uh, traditionally every year numbers of employees, they pay more into the trust fund than an employer that um, lays off people less frequently or at all. <clears throat> it was decided, the legislature um, said that during this situation, uh, employers would not have their experience rating charged uh, if people were being laid off because of the pandemic. So that was done with the main um, state unemployment insurance program. In addition to that, Congress also took some action and passed in uh, the CARES Act uh, several pieces of new unemployment insurance um, programs. One was the federal the okay. federal pandemic, pandemic. <laughs> unemployment compensation, which is the $600 that um, people often refer to it as. And then, uh, and so that program uh, is uh, time limited. It goes until the week of July 25th. And if you're eligible for regular unemployment insurance, uh, state unemployment insurance, the, the extra $600 is in addition to the state weekly benefit. In Maine, the maximum weekly benefit is $445 a week. Um, most people in Maine do not get the maximum. They probably get about $350 a week. That program was passed by Congress. Uh, we received guidance around it and um, we started paying out. Uh, we got that program up and running late last week, I think last Thursday. And so people are beginning to see those uh, additional $600 benefits in with their unemployment and um, benefits. Uh, it was retroactive to uh, April 4th, it was the week ending April 4th, and people should have received those benefits uh, beginning last week. The next program is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, and that's a program that uh, a lot of people are using the shorthand, the self-employed, the program for the self-employed. Um, we received guidance. The other thing about unemployment insurance is not only does it have two parties, the employee and the employer who have to each provide information, <clears throat> it's also a federal state partnership. So each state operates a program, but it's, um, we have to follow federal guidelines for um, most of, uh, we have to be consistent with a, a number of federal guidelines. U.S. Department of Labor has provided the guidance to us on the pandemic unemployment assistance. There's still a little bit of guidance that they are um, that we're waiting to receive, but that uh, development, the software development for that particular program, is in the works right now, um, and uh, we'll hopeful that you will be um, seeing that rolled out soon. The final piece is the uh, extended benefits. So this is uh, an additional federal program that would extend unemployment insurance, which is typically 26 weeks. It would extend it an additional 13 weeks. Um, and uh, we just received guidance on that program and that will probably be the last one um, that rolls out. Um, to just make things even more complicated is there is also a state 13 week extension that depends on the level of unemployment in your state. And if it hits a certain level, that state program also kicks in. Uh, and because of the incredibly high uh, numbers that we're seeing, we may be triggering on to that state unemployment benefit program um, in, the, in the coming weeks as well. So, and if I could actually add on to that, um, part of the CARES Act was to include federal funding for those state extended benefits. Um, usually it's a 50-50 match, but in, in this time, the, the feds have said that they will pick up 100% of those extended benefits. 
um, the, the first program that the commissioner spoke about is called Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation. So those are an additional 13 weeks um, you know, beyond the original 26, mm -hmm. beyond the state extended benefits, there is the PEUC, which is another 13 weeks of benefits should somebody be unemployed for that long. And the other thing I wanted to add that was in the CARES Act is the funding for that, that waiting week that we waived. Mm -hmm. um, the feds are also picking up the cost of that waiting week. So that's not going to hit the unemployment trust fund. Right, which is very good news. Um, <clears throat> you know, Maine had a, um, a fairly uh, solvent trust fund before this started. You may have heard other states are extremely concerned. Um, it's not that we're not concerned, but we, we're starting this at a, at a pretty good place. We had 15.8 months of um, reserve um, in the trust fund when this began. Um, and so any of those federal programs that will be paid for out of the uh, federal fund is very, very helpful. Uh, the other thing that the, uh, and I, I know there are some questions about this, but the other thing that the CARES Act did is that um, some employers have the opportunity, the option to not pay into the trust fund and instead be direct reimbursable when they um, have uh, people who are laid off what the CARES Act, and then they are responsible for 100% of the unemployment benefits that are paid to any of their employees. What the CARES Act did was it um, said that there will be a federal match for 50% of those costs for those direct reimbursable employers. Uh, so that is um, very good news. So I think that's a, an incredibly top line overview of all of the various moving parts. Um, and so Quincia, Quincia Julia, want to to questions? Yes, happy to. Thank you so much for that overview. That was really helpful. Um, and I'm just going to ask a couple quick questions, then I might hand it over to Julia to ask a few of her questions. But the federal $600 that you mentioned, is that going to be automatically included in individuals unemployment? Like if they file for state unemployment, do they have to do anything in addition to, to get the 600? No, it's no. The, the only requirement is that you must be eligible for one of the unemployment insurance programs. So if you're eligible for state unemployment or once the um, pandemic unemployment assistance program is available, if you're eligible for that, you will automatically be eligible for that $600. Um, and again, that's a time limited program. Uh, so that that doesn't that doesn't last beyond July 25th. Wonderful. And then um, I, I've gotten this question from a few individuals. Does it matter how long an individual has been employed at their current place of employment in order for them to collect unemployment? I've heard from some people that they feel or they think that they need to have been um, working at their current place of employment for at least one year. No, you want to handle that no. one? <laughs> um, so the only requirement is on their their earnings for the for their base period that the commissioner talked about, which is the previous five full calendar quarters. Uh, as long as they earned at least seventeen hundred dollars in two of those quarters and five thousand and something overall, they are eligible to apply for unemployment benefits. So it does not matter how long they work for their current employer. If somebody just came on and they this is their first job and they worked for a month and then they were affected by uh, COVID nineteen, they would in theory be eligible for unemployment benefits. Um, in this case, like I said, if it's their first job, they work for a month, they're probably not monetarily eligible, but that's where the pandemic unemployment assistance comes in. That is for people who have just a recent connection to the workforce, but not enough to be monetarily eligible for state unemployment. Yeah, so Quincy, we're hearing from, um, I mean, actually one of the challenges that we're seeing <clears throat> is that, um, if I'm filing for unemployment insurance, I need to know who my employers have been. I may have had multiple employers over the last 18 months. And so when I fill out my, um, my initial claim, 
the wage records, I'm going to say, oh, I worked at, you know, Sue's flower shop on such and such a street. And that wage information should pop up. And then I need to verify, yep, I worked for at Sue's, um, but I also worked at some other places. Uh, and, um, and that's where some people are running into problems because I thought it was Sue's, but it was actually, you know, McMaster's Limited that that was the official name of the company. And so people are saying, no, I didn't work there. And then it becomes um, an issue where we're going to have to do what we call a fact finding. Um, any separation is going to involve um, the two parties, the individual who puts information down and the employer. And the employer needs to verify two things. If there's a discrepancy about the wages, they need to verify that part. And also the reason for the separation from the job. Great, thank you for that. Um, we're getting a few questions in right now focused on the self-employed mm -hmm. and when unemployment benefits might be available for those individuals. A fair question. We're in the middle. Uh, any kind of a, um, anytime you stand up a new program, there are a number of steps that you need to go through. Again, like I said, we needed to have guidance from the US Department of Labor. Uh, you need to gather the requirements of what's involved in these programs. You need to do uh, software development. Um, we are in the development phase of that process right now, and we're working as quickly as possible to get it up. The best way to find out when it's happening is to check on our website, and we will update that as, um, as soon as information is available. Great. And as soon as that is available for the self-employed, this is just a note for all of those listening. The chamber will be sure to alert you to that as well. We'll be tracking that closely and you'll get a notification from us as well when that's available. Um, Julia, let me turn it over to you for a few questions. Sure. Thank you, Quincy. And thank you, Commissioner, for being with us this afternoon. Um, there are several questions that came through related to our immigrant workforce, um, and I just thought I'd give you an opportunity to touch base on a few of them. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so as you know, Maine's workforce includes a lot, of, a lot of limited English proficient populations, and in general, for all workers in Maine and probably around the nation, the, the unemployment process has been uh, somewhat challenging to go through the process, et cetera. So with a, a, a language barrier added to that, it becomes even more challenging to navigate. Um, and there's many of us at the local and regional level who are trying to support this population. But I wonder if you could speak to um, just the general uh, next steps that maybe the department is thinking about doing in order to mitigate these challenges for the limited English proficient population. Sure. So Julia, thank you um, for the question and also for the work that you're doing. I mean, uh, we recognize that this is a significant problem. We have dedicated one of our staff people here at the department to be a, a point person between the department and, um, and the uh, immigrant community to try to work through some of the challenges. We realize that it's not sufficient. Um, but that is what we've been able to do so far. And um, we're in the process of having um, materials translated. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Kim, if you wanted to add to that or? Um, we'll be starting with our frequently asked questions that we've posted on the website and we'll be working to get those translated um, into a couple of different languages. Also, um, I was on our 800 line, I know it's incredibly difficult sometimes to get through on our 800 line, but we do have interpreter services available. Um, it, if we know that someone has called and they need help, we will work with them. We have a contract, we'll get the contractor on board to help us identify what language is needed and then have that translator available. The other thing that I do want to say as well, Julia, is um, you know, when we first uh, went into this pandemic, it was almost, it was, it, it felt like it was overnight. You know, we went from under, you know, 800 initial claims a week to now thousands of claims a week. Um, 
And uh, I think all of us were hoping that this was going to be kind of a very quick turnaround. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's not. Uh, and one of the things that we will be doing, uh, especially given the complexity of the federal programs, is we know that we will need to be uh, working on these issues uh, for months to come, and we will be hiring additional Department of Labor staff, um, and we will uh, definitely be hoping that there will be members of the uh, immigrant community who would be interested in applying for those positions, and we should have some postings coming out in the next couple of weeks. And when you think about the unemployment insurance system, it's not just people who are um, uh, benefit, um, you know, taking like uh, customer service people taking benefit claims. It requires tax auditors, um, accountants. Uh, you know, there there are a wide range of skills and um, positions that we will be uh, um, hiring for. Thank you. Um, I think uh, as soon as you have those positions available, I think a lot of us on the ground will be able to share them. And, and the good news here, at least in Portland, is that a lot of our foreign trained population, one of the top sectors is our finance and accounting right. sector. So I, I remembered that as we were as we were talking about it. Wow. So thank you. Quincy. Great. Thanks, Julia. Um, Let's talk a little bit about reduction in hours for employees or work share. I know, Kim, you've been so helpful. I've gotten so many questions on this issue over the last week, and you've been incredibly helpful answering them. So thank you very much for that. Thank and you. we're getting a lot of those same questions right now. Um, could you talk a little bit about what work share is and, and just how it might work with a reduction in hours and the ability for those employees to collect unemployment to make up some of the difference. Sure, so WorkShare is a layoff aversion program that was established at the federal level that states have the option to implement. And we implemented um, maybe a decade ago. So it's been on the books for a while, but not widely used. And um, basically what it allows an employer to work with us to keep all of their, their workforce, um, but reduce the hours. So you, there can be uh, an hours reduction in a defined unit, or it can be across the entire organization, but you have to be able to identify at least minimally what a unit is. And then there's a reduction anywhere from 10% to 50% of the hours for that person. So let's just say it's a 50% reduction for a particular unit. Um, the employer can then work with our staff to apply for the WorkShare program. And then when approved, those individuals can continue working the 50% of the time, and then they would receive 50% of their normal state unemployment benefits um, without having to report, um, the, without having to have an, a further reduction. Whereas somebody who might normally be working 50% of their time may be earning more than their unemployment benefits and therefore not receiving anything. In this case, they receive a proportional share of their unemployment benefits. And they would also be eligible for the $600. They would in this um, case, yes. Again, for that time limited period. And is, this, is the $600 prorated in any way? It is so not. it's $600 regardless if you're furloughed entirely or working part-time. Correct. Yeah, this is that, that was one of the requirements of the federal program was that um, the states uh, would just um, implement it exactly as it was passed. So if you're eligible for any amount of unemployment insurance, you receive the full 600. Uh, it can be reduced um, by, uh, we're, uh, by up to 25% for certain um, outstanding obligations that, that you owe. And taxes can and be taxes. at the um, individual's yeah. option, right? Oh, that was another question is, is unemployment taxed? Yes. And then as Kim said, you either have the option to have the taxes taken out now or pay, pay them later. Okay. We send out 1099 G forms at the end of every calendar year. 
Okay. And one other question, we may get more questions on the work share program, but one other question I do want to ask is if you as the employer were to reduce, let's say your entire staff's hours by 50% to start the work share program, do you have the ability over the next few months to amend that program and maybe bring your employees up to just a 25% reduction? Can you, can you move, um, how much you've reduced hours over the next few months as businesses try to ramp back up. You can, but it, it is a, a re amendment of the contract with the department. It's not okay. something you just automatically do. You have to be in contact with our unemployment department to do that. Okay, okay, that's great. And this is um, for up, up to one year time period. For the work share program, you could, an employer can do this for one year. Yes. Fantastic. Um, I'm looking at other questions here. Let's see. Okay, here's a great question. If an employer has furloughed employees and decides to bring them back, but then at a later date realizes they have to lay off again, which this is totally possible in this current situation, does the employee have to start over again in the unemployment process? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, if, if it's a, one of those situations where, you know, the employer knows, okay, I, I can call folks back for a three week period, we would encourage people to keep filing for those three weeks and reporting the wages that they earned and that keeps their account active. Um, but if, you know, the employer's intent is to bring back the workforce and keep them on and then things change, uh, it does require talking with somebody in our unemployment bureau to reopen their, their, their claim. Um, so really, that's the, the distinction. They still have their, their benefit year um, available to them, but we just need to reopen, mm -hmm. reactivate their account. Okay. And, and the other thing um, to just keep in mind about that, as Kim said, um, you would be filing your weekly claim, but also identifying the wages that you were earning during, during those weeks, if it was a short term and you would not be receiving any benefits. You would just be keeping your, your account open. Um, and I think sometimes people get confused about that. Right. Okay. Two really quick questions about works share, and then I'm going to bounce it back over to you, Julia. Um, if an employer has entered into an, a contract with DOL to do a work share program, is the employer required to also file paperwork every week regarding how many hours their employees have worked or once there's a contract signed, is it just up to the employees to do the unemployment side? Right, if the contract is done upfront and then it's expected that the employer abides by that contract. And then each week, each individual worker files their, uh, their unemployment, their weekly certification, either online or through our IVR, our interactive voice response system. But so there isn't anything for the employer to do on a weekly basis. Okay, and is there any income threshold um, for any employee who might be on work share and then wanting to collect unemployment? No, the only requirement is that they be part of the defined unit. Fantastic, thank you for that. Um, Julia, let me turn it over to you for a question or two. Sure, so there's a, a related question um, from the worker side in regards to the requirements um, that they have to follow on a weekly basis. So I think there's a little bit of confusion between the difference between uh, filing the weekly claim and the job requirement that used to be in place that I believe has now been waived. So I wonder if you could speak to a little bit of, of the difference between the two. Sure, so the weekly um, certification um, must be filled out every week in order to continue the benefits um, moving forward. I think the the question is about the, um, the work search portion, which is typically part of any sort of, um, of unemployment insurance receipt. You must look for work. We, that has been waived through May 14th at this point. Um, and so you do not need to be actively looking for work, but if you are offered work back with your employer, um, unless you have good cause, the expectation is that you would be going back to that employer. We are encouraging people to, when they sign up for unemployment, to also um, sign up at the job bank and have a 
profile created there and um, include a resume so that you can see what is available uh, and that when that work search does trigger back on, that you would have everything in place so that you could smoothly um, begin filing the appropriate uh, documentation for work search. Thank you. That's very helpful. We're creating some uh, one page resource guides here at the local level and all that information, um, it will be helpful for us to include. Uh, there's also another question that it's, it departs a little bit from all of this, but it's in regards to seasonal employment. Some employers are um, obviously, I mean, we don't know what the season is going to look like, but really it, it, some uh, seasonal employers like ice cream shops and things like that are already in motion. So I wonder if you could speak to a little bit about both the H-2A and H-2B programs and even the J-1 or the J-2, how, how is that being affected, if anything, or if you've get, gotten any guidance from USDOL uh, in regards to seasonal employment? So the H programs are programs that um, the main Department of Labor interacts with a little bit. Um, we have the state monitor advocate, who um, Jorge Acero, who has been working closely with employers. We've issued guidance uh, around um, agricultural employers. Uh, that information is up on our website. Um, and as far as we know, uh, guest workers will um, still be coming uh, to Maine uh, and um, abiding by the appropriate CDC uh, guidance um, so that everyone stays healthy. Thank you. That's, that's it for now over here, Quincy. Pass it back to you. Thanks, Julia. Um, a quick question about WorkShare. Some people are interested in learning more. How does an employer apply to participate in the WorkShare program? Um, well, we have a couple of subject matter experts who work with employers that are interested and um, the, the specific website itself where all of the information is the exact web address is escaping me. But if you go to main.gov slash unemployment, and then on the left-hand side is a tab for employers. Uh, and then in services offered, there's all of the information about WorkShare and then there's contact information. There's a telephone number to call to get the ball rolling um, on that contract. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, here is a question that we have received. It says, many of our employees are laid off due to COVID-19 and they've been receiving notices of phone conferences scheduled in May or June and have been told that they will not receive their unemployment benefits until the phone conference takes place. Um, are they really, are they that delayed in the phone conference and do the individuals have to wait until that happens to actually collect benefits? So another, it depends. Um, yes, uh, we, as, as I laid out earlier, um, this is a two-party system and there are, um, if questions are raised around either wages or the reason for separation or something else that was put on the initial um, application, uh, it could trigger a fact finding. Normally fact findings take place within three weeks. Um, we realize that waiting eight, 12 weeks is not, um, it, it's just, it, it's not appropriate. Um, so we've been working with the um, attorney general's office to see if we can streamline some of those processes and um, kind of batch some of the decision-making so that we don't have to go out that far. That will not eliminate all of the fact finding, but it will reduce it um, to uh, instances where there, we really don't have another option and it may free up, it will free up fact finding that's closer. We're going to be taking those steps later this week. So people may be receiving information uh, either electronically or through the mail from us um, starting probably Friday. Um, please pay attention to what it says in there. Uh, it will provide additional information about next steps that you need to take. Uh, there will also be a number of people who will receive monetary denials 
um, we're evaluating all of the wages and that will come out uh, in a group as well. Anyone who receives a denial of benefits is entitled to an appeal process. However, if you are monetarily ineligible for regular state unemployment insurance, you may um, and likely will be eligible for the pandemic unemployment assistance program. So don't lose heart. Um, there, the federal program, again, we're trying to get up as quickly as possible. And um, one of the requirements for the federal program is that you must not be eligible for state unemployment insurance. So even if it sounds like bad news, if you get a denial, it may actually be the first step toward qualifying for the uh, federal program. Thank you. Um, here's a question around benefits and furloughed, furloughed employees. So the question is, if I have furloughed employees and I'm continuing to pay benefits, what happens if my employees pay a portion of those benefit costs? Do they still have to continue paying their portion of benefits or does the employer then cover that? I assume benefits, we're talking about health insurance, dental, that kind of stuff. I would stuff. think so, yeah. Um, the, 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 the fringe benefits that are offered have no impact on unemployment benefits. So that would be a decision that each employer could make whether uh, requiring their, their staff to continue to pick up their portion of health insurance or to pay the full boat themselves. Okay, thank you. Um, let me ask this question and then Julia, I'll turn it back over to you if you have another question. Um, for those of us self-employed independent contractors waiting on the federal $600 benefit, can you speak to what materials will be needed for verification? Some of us have employment around the country but live here in Maine. Huh. So for, the, the, yeah, for self it's, you're still self-employment, right? Um, so I would say the, and if you taxes. can show that you're, you, you know, you filed your taxes with your main mm -hmm. address, um, and even if the work was around the country, it's, it's really those tax forms. Uh, I know we have information on our website about the different schedules that we are looking for. You know, 2019, 2019 will take if you filed, if you haven't, we'll take 2018. Okay, we can share that and we'll, we'll look on your website and maybe put that information out to those who are listening right now around the self employment question. Um, Julia, I will turn it over to you if you have a question. Great segue because I have a self employment question. Um, and then let me just read it to you. It's a little bit detail oriented, but if you're not able to answer it, like Quincy said at the beginning, or um, happy to share the responses later on. The question is, will a person who is self-employed by, by paying taxes with an ITIN qualify for the federal pandemic unemployment assistance if the person can provide records of their taxes filed with the ITIN as, as a self-employed person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that what we're looking for is the proof of, um, of earnings and we'll be looking to tax forms to provide that. So that's, that sounds perfectly appropriate. Okay. The, the other group, I mean, we keep talking about self-employed, but the pandemic unemployment assistance program is not just for people who are self-employed. It also covers people who are not traditionally covered by state unemployment insurance. So it's a much broader group. And as we're um, putting that program up and running, we're taking those other folks into consideration as well. Like Kim mentioned earlier, um, you know, I was, uh, I may not have worked very long uh, in the job market. Maybe I'm a recent uh, graduate. Maybe I um, have just uh, recently moved to the country. I, I may not have a long job history. Um, we would, and perhaps uh, I was offered a job and I even moved here to take the job. And then when I got here, it, it closed. Um, we're also looking at what kind of documentation would we need from those folks. And so in those cases, it may be an actual uh, copy of the job offer that you had in order to come here or some other, some other documentation that we would need as verification. 
That's that's very helpful. And I, I have a follow up question that is sort of related to this. Um, and it's related to the different types of immigrants who who have different work authorization um, kind of validation. So if we talk about, for example, the asylum seekers who um, have work permits for specific time frames. Uh, what has happened is that obviously at the federal level, they they have extended uh, these work authorizations automatically for 180 days. So what uh, should an immigrant do who receives a denial that may reflect a misunderstanding of one of the work permit complications, uh, like the one that I mentioned? Yeah. I, I think in those cases, Julia, we're, we're going to actually have to have a, a conversation in, uh, that will involve uh, fact finding, um, but let's let's just stay in touch about situations like that. Okay. Thanks, Julia. Um, I have a couple questions here that I can ask. Um, here's one: Is there any means by which employers can check the status of their employees' claims and be able to provide the Department of Labor any information needed to help clarify the employee information? Sides. So certainly, sides is the easiest way to do that. That's where an employer will be electronically notified of anyone, any one of their former employees who has filed an application. Um, for benefits, they would be notified. There's also the, the quarterly statement, um, but there is no way on a, on a week to week basis for an employer to go in and check on the status of their, um, their workers' claims. That's, uh, we can't share that information. Um, sides um, is, is something that you can sign up for where you, you'll have an account. It's, it's different than your um, unemployment portal, um, but it is connected. So you do need to sign up for that separately, but then we will be automatically emailing um, information so that you can fill it out online. There's no paper going back and forth that certainly makes things go faster. The other thing I'd like to mention is that we are, um, you know, given the unprecedented circumstances, taking spreadsheets from employers. So if you've got a big group of folks, um, we can work with you to send you a spreadsheet. You fill out the spreadsheet and we will upload that. We'll make it much easier on all of us uh, mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah, and as an additional follow-up to that too, um, some people who um, may not have had the earnings through January that they needed, they would be counting on that January through March timeframe to make them monetarily eligible. Um, employers have until the end of April to provide that wage data. Uh, and if you provide that, um, uh, quickly, that will also help with those monetary eligibility uh, determinations. Again, great. electronically would be great. Thank you. Here's a question that we've received quite a few times for this webinar and that we have also received over the last few weeks. Um, if a current furloughed employee is receiving unemployment benefits and the employer offers work, and that employee declines, how does that information reach the Department of Labor and what should the next step be for the employer? So um, it, it's a two-party um, uh, exchange. We would expect the employer to notify us. Um, employees still have a responsibility to accept anything that's considered suitable work. Um, because of the pandemic and the um, pandemic unemployment assistance, so the federal program provided some uh, good cause exemptions that are typically not included in unemployment insurance. So for example, if you have to stay home to take care of a child um, because the school is closed and you need that um, that child care in order to go to work, that could be a good cause exemption. So these are the situations where we would actually have to hear from both parties in order to make a determination. And then um, once a determination is made, um, there are appeal rights on both sides. So if you feel that you've been treated unfairly, then it gets bumped up um, to the next level of, uh, of uh, authority to make that decision. 
And I encourage employers to notify us. Our employer services division has hours every afternoon. Um, and unfortunately, again, I'm going to refer you to that employer website. I don't have it right in front of me to, for the phone number. You can also send a letter into um, employer services division to notify us that an offer has been made and rejected. Right. And again, I'd look at the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance uh, for the qualifying reasons for um, for not coming back to work because it's uh, it's including some things in there that that are traditionally not included right. in the um, in the suitable work and refusal of suitable work. Um, and one of the things that would be looked at would be if the person was concerned, maybe they had a compromised uh, immune system, didn't feel comfortable coming back to work, but did the employer offer a telework option to them? You know, and we would hope that people would be working these things out. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question now related to the Paycheck Protection Program, which I know there's some interesting intersection between that program and unemployment. And the question is that um, I temporarily laid off my employees, but have now received a Paycheck Protection Program fund and plan to bring employees back on payroll. However, there's no work for them at this time. Would you advise I let them continue to just receive unemployment or bring them back on payroll despite the lack of work? And this may just, the answer may be, it's kind of up to the employer how to handle it. <laughs> that, that's pretty much it, Quincy. It's, you know, that's an individual business decision. Um, we are hearing lots of questions from both employees and employers about what is this intersection between unemployment insurance and the payroll protection plan. Um, and uh, we're, we're having conversations with the Department of Economic and Community Development to, to try to um, provide additional clarity. Even though DECD is not the group that oversees the Paycheck Protection Plan, um, uh, it's the Small Business Administration, but I know they have information on their website and we will try to at least provide clarity around um, how unemployment insurance will be looking at these issues. Great, thank you. Puglia, I will turn it to you if you have a question. Well, I'll wrap it up with um, sort of a general question. We get questions uh, from employers and community organizations and others who are trying to support employees in this process. So um, I'm wondering if there's um, if the department is thinking of a train the trainer model or something like that that a place where we could direct these folks that are trying to support employees in, in going through the unemployment process. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Julia for us, I mean, we try to do as much as possible. Um, you know, that, that we can do. I know that there are some community organizations that are trying to do a train the trainer model. For example, organizations like the Maine Equal Justice um, Partners, um, they have uh, pretty extensive experience with un understanding unemployment law. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I believe they're trying to do uh, something along those lines we'll do the best we can, but I think that um, it's gonna take a lot of us. It's complicated and um, and I think, and, and for whatever reason, unemployment insurance was never on anyone's like top list of things to learn about. Thank you. Uh, we have a, probably about eight or nine minutes left. And I just have a couple of questions here. I know it's, I'm getting so many questions from the chats. I've got two chats going and I've actually got a list of questions in front of me and I'm trying to navigate these and it's a little more challenging <laughs> than I thought it would be. But again, we're gonna try to get answers to all of these questions that are coming through. Um, so I, I know you had mentioned SIDES. I think Kim had mentioned SIDES and somebody here is asking that they'd like to sign up for SIDES but are unsure how. And they're also specifically asking what is an EAN and how do I get one? An EIN e employer probably. identification number? Probably. <laughs> yeah. um, 
that's beyond my area of expertise, how to get an EIN, but you have to register with the, the Secretary state. of State. Mm -hmm. You have to register with us as an employer with Maine Revenue Services. Um, and I don't know the process at the federal level for an FEIN. Um, and then for sides, it, again, it's sides. on the yep. website. Um, so maine.gov slash unemployment down in the bottom left corner um, is, a, is a login for reemploy me. And once you click on that, it will take you to the login either as a claimant or an employer. And also right there on the employer side is sign up for sides. So if you click on that, um, it will walk you through the process. We do have to send you a pin number that will come through the mail. You'll get that and that will help you um, finish the, the sign up for sides. Unfortunately, um, you know, it's becoming more popular now because people are receiving stacks of paper. But unfortunately, once we do something in paper, it needs to be finished in paper. But if you do sign up for sides going forward, it's gonna be much easier for both of us. I have some um, helpful conversation happening in the chat right now around EAN. Apparently it stands for employer account number. Um, and so that might be the question, how do they get the employer account number? Uh, so I would say call our employer services division during their afternoon hours and they will okay. walk you through that process. Okay. Thank you. I'm just reading through these chats right there. Um, here's a question from somebody who has applied for unemployment and are now receiving the weekly benefit, but no taxes are being taken out. Is there a way that they can change that to have taxes taken out now? Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is an option when you do that initial filing. Um, I don't know whether it's something you can just go into your claimant portal and update or whether that's a conversation with a claims rep, but we'll find out the answer to that. Great, thank you. Um, and another question that I've seen coming through the chat today and that I've just had in general is how, what's the delay or how long is it taking for individuals to actually receive unemployment once they have filed? And again, it depends. If you file and you have what's, um, you know, no issues at all with your claim, uh, it's really clear that you met the monetary, monetary eligibility requirements, you've left the job through no fault of your own. You said that of course you're able and available to work. Um, so you've answered all of the questions correctly. Uh, you're receiving benefits um, between 10 days and two weeks. And that's a standard process for us. Uh, and that is still happening during that same time frame. Um, the holdup is there are questions around the, the monetary eligibility or wages. And so we're either trying to get additional information from the individual or from the employer, or people have said they're not able to work or available to work or that they voluntarily quit their job. Um, those are the things that require us to get more information. And when you have 89,000 initial claims, talking to even if only 30,000 of them have um, issues, that, that's why you started seeing those fact findings scheduled out to May and June. And that's what we're trying to, to, um, to streamline now. But those are all questions that need to be answered before we can issue benefits. Um, the other thing today um, we received uh, uh, a letter or um, a document from the Office of the Inspector General at the U.S. Department of Labor. All states received it, reminding all of us um, of the importance of getting these funds out as quickly as possible and also as accurately as possible. And that um, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. And that's actually, I, I have a final question. I know we're running short on time and I have one more question that I've just kind of seen come through today. I know there is a huge backlog. People are not able to get through on the phones. Um, I'm not sure what types of email options are out there, but I just know there's been a delay and it's totally understandable because this is such a I hate to use the word, but I'm going to say it, unprecedented situation. And I feel like your department has really reacted quite quickly to this. And But there's still a lot of people trying to get through. 
Um, what is everyone's best course of action? And I will also add, I've seen it in the chat today, this has been very helpful for people. So if we're able to do something like this again, and I know commissioner, we're very sensitive to your time, but if you have individuals in the department who might like to do this call, even once a week to just answer some questions for an hour, I think we have been able to get through a good deal of questions and I do think this has been really helpful. So that's my parting question is your best advice for people in order to get through to the unemployment office and would you or some of your staff be willing to do this again? Sure, I'll answer the last question first. Of course, we'd be happy to do it. Um, and um, the best way is uh, if, if you've tried to go online and run into some sort of a roadblock, then, um, then you have two avenues. Well, you've got three. The, the career centers are able to help if it's a password reset. We have eight people doing password resets all day long. So the first, the first thing I would say is as soon as you open your account, please write down your password. Or if um, you didn't write it down or you're someplace else and you don't remember what it is, never try to do your password more than twice. Three strikes and you're out. Yes, because then you're locked out of your account and then you have to talk to a, a live human being. So first thing is password reset, go through the career center. And make sure you're, you have verified your email address once you are in your portal the first time. So that's how the, the password is reset through the email that's on file. If you didn't verify your email, then you're going to have to talk to somebody. The next thing is the 800 number. We have um, uh, hired a main based call center who has gone through um, unemployment insurance training. And so we have about 100 people on the phones um, a, every day, um, which may or may not sound like a lot of people, but we started this out four or five weeks ago with 13 people. So it is significantly more than that. We also encourage people to go with the alphabet um, that we had laid out for folks. So calling on certain days based on your last name. Um, and then the third thing is that we do have a customer message portal. So that is an email uh, way of contacting us that is on the uh, main DOL website. There's a contact me you're not going to get any sort of an immediate answer, but what that does is it logs your question into the queue and people do work through those as quickly as possible. All benefits will be paid retroactively. Um, so uh, even though it's kind of cold comfort, um, it's if you are eligible, uh, you will be paid all of the benefits that you were owed back to the date of your layoff. That is great. Thank you so much for that. And we will get some of that information out to those who are listening right now, just some contact info. You've got some great FAQ information on your website as well that we will share. I know it's answered a lot of questions that I've been getting from members myself. So thank you for that. Um, thank you both for your time and for all that you are doing to help the people of Maine. I know this is something that has never been seen before. And we really appreciate everything that you and the entire department, the entire administration is doing. Thank you. And we would like to take you up on the offer of doing this again. So I'll talk to you offline okay. and maybe we can set up, you know, an hour Q&A next week just to answer some more questions because I know we didn't get through everything. Okay. Thanks, Quincy. Thank, thank you. Julia. Thank take you. care. Thank you. Thank you. Julia. Thank you.